Hey everyone, I'm Brian Coherent. Today I want to review The Ends with Conspiracy. I just finished playing it on the channel, and I'm going to go through scenario by scenario and talk about all the iconic cards in the scenarios, what I think is good about the scenarios and what I think is bad, and then rank them on the tier list that I update after I finish each campaign. Obviously, you can see by this approach that I'm not going to be doing a spoiler free. If you want a quick yes or no answer, should you get The Ends with Conspiracy? Yes, The Ends with Conspiracy is a good campaign, and I would say that about pretty much every single Arkham Horror campaign out there. And to answer in any more nuanced detail than that is going to require spoilers. So, with your warning out of the way, let's get into it. Let's start with Scenario 1, The Pit of Despair. I think more than any other scenario in all of Arkham Horror, The Pit of Despair feels like a tutorial, but in a really good way. The entirety of the Pit of Despair is the Tidal Tunnel deck. You're not seeing any locations that aren't a Tidal Tunnel. And the Tidal Tunnels are going to be a pretty constant presence through Innsmouth, to its detriment later on. Likewise, all the enemies you're, you're seeing are going to be the deep ones. These enemies that have engage effects, where even if you alpha strike them down and kill them in one turn, there's still going to be some sort of problem. You're still going to take the horror or the damage just by having spawned them. That does a really good job of setting up the atmosphere and the mechanics, as well as the flashbacks, things that I can't really represent with cards here. The keys, the tunnels, the enemies, all of it is a really good introduction to the mechanics you're going to be seeing throughout all the rest of Insta. And even though it's not like a particularly brilliant scenario in and of itself, in fact, I have some pretty big worries about how negative experience can be, I think it's a really well-executed tutorial. And that's not necessarily a bad thing that it is a tutorial. Coming over to the tier list, I think I would place Pit of Despair right in the middle of A tier. Curtain Call is actually a pretty similar scenario. It's a tutorial to many of the mechanics you'll see throughout Carcosa, but as a scenario, I feel like the Royal Emissary and the layout of the theater is much more thematically powerful and interesting from a gameplay perspective than the Amalgam is in Pit of Despair, and the title tunnels are maybe comparably good to the theater if they hadn't grossly overstayed their welcome by the end of this. And it does make me sad putting Pit of Despair above Lost in Time and Space, but that is a finale that has really not held up as I played it more and more times. Moving on to the Banishing of Alina Harper, I'm going to give you a peek at what's set aside for N2D, the same cards that are set aside for Banishing. So I'm going to talk about them sort of at the same time. The Angry Mob is not a threatening enemy, but it is a massive enemy that demands your attention, and it is a big, beefy enemy. It's going to take you a while to chew through it. And the Instant Troublemaker is actually one of my favorite enemy cards in the entire game. It's a 4 fist, 3 health enemy, which at Scenario 2 is very hard for you to deal with. It's a hunter enemy that will spawn at the location with the most clues, which will basically guarantee it's some form of inconvenience for you. And hitting for 2 health damage it is not something that can easily be ignored. Of course, you'll never have to ignore it, because between its 2 foot, the fact that you can just be a good enough fighter to kill it, and its parlay action, where I drop one of my clues to exhaust it for 2 turns, it's just something you can deal with. There are plenty of different ways to counterplay the Inspa Troublemaker, and it feels like a really serious problem as well. The Inspa Troublemaker is just really well designed. I love it as a big, threatening enemy that defines a scenario. The problem is, in Vanishing, it's defining a bad scenario. You can play 90% of Vanishing of Alina Harper, and it won't be that bad. The problem is that the way you progress is by revealing new locations at random, so you might be told to backtrack arbitrarily in a way where you had no control over what was happening, and then you flip a coin to see whether or not you're even allowed to play the last act. And if you had any good feelings about Vanishing Melina Harper, they're all going to vanish when you come play Into Deep, which has the same strong points, but none of its weaknesses and quite a few additional strengths as well. So coming over to the tier list for Vanishing Melina Harper, the way I feel in my gut, the way I think about this scenario, like, straight bottom of up here immediately, what the hell are they doing with the act deck in this scenario? But I mean, in reality, I'd rather play it than Echoes of the Past, I think. It's pretty close, but it's definitely a C-tier scenario. Because the fact is that the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Vanishing Unita Harper is fine. Playing Where Duma Waits or Miskatonic Museum or Devour Below is actually unfun. You're having a bad time. And that's not true in Vanishing of Alina Harper. You just turn off your brain and stop stressing about the act deck being garbage, because it doesn't really matter. Then you're gonna be fine. Like, the gameplay is fine. It's not the best. It's not a crazy. I'd say its gameplay is, like, low end of good. It's just that the act deck is so bad that makes you not want to play this scenario. 
And I do think it's a fair point that if you just don't stress about that, the scenario is much, much better. Still not good, but fine, tolerable, not bad. Continuing our discussion about N2 Deep, though, not only does N2 Deep run the same cards that make Vanishing actually engaging, the map is actually more interesting. They're using a lot of the same locations, but with N2 Deep, those locations are a 5x3 grid. Let's just place N2 Deep, that's a faster way to do this. This is the map for N2 Deep. And these barricades that are preventing you from moving around as you would otherwise like to do are actually like a very interesting decision point with how you're going to clear them, whether you use this act ability or whatever parlay ability happens to be at your location. Ultimately, I think the fact that the optimal play is pretty transparently to zigzag through in this path is the biggest weakness of the scenario. And there's a couple of things in the encounter deck that make it prone to variance. Inundated is a card that can represent tremendous variance. It's not going to have the same effect every time you roll it at all. The same is true of Deep One Invasion. You could draw this like every fourth turn, or maybe you never draw it at all like I did. And again, Pulled Back is a tremendously high variance card. If you're at the start of the scenario and you get hit with Pulled Back on March Refinery, you lose an action. You move back. Not a big deal. If you're at this location, and you flip over to Church Green and you're here, and then it pulls you back through three barriers and four or five movements away, that is a serious problem. There is a tremendous amount of variance that happens with these three cards that is a real problem in N2D. However, what's not a real problem is that Angry Mob and Inns with Shaga are both spawning right here, dead middle of the map, and the Inns with Square. Just ignore the fact that there are a bunch of Devil Reefs hanging about because I've set up this near half of an open. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And you're going to be triggering the Inns with Square effect usually at a pretty close time to when the agenda flips and summons the angry mob. So this situation happens where there's just a bloodbath going on in the middle of the scenario, and that tends to be a really, really good thing. And speaking of a bloodbath, the cards that I view as iconic for this set are not those high variance ones. They're the Ends of the Troublemakers and the Ravagers from the Deep, just these big, chunky enemies that you have to deal with. End to Deep is a very combat-heavy scenario, and... I really enjoy that. I enjoy being given a map, seeing what my options are from the word go, and getting told to make whatever decisions I feel are best, and then the encounter deck just throws big piles of threatening enemies at you. I think a big part of why so many people just downright hate Vanishing is because right after you play Vanishing, you play in too deep, which does everything Vanishing does well better with none of the same problems. And I think for me, it's an easy A+. I'm not quite sure if it's above or below the Pallid Mask, I think it's below it, but just barely. But I do really, really like Into Deep. It's a fantastic scenario. The fact that it's prone to really bad variants does make me hesitant. It could be like after I play it three or four more times, like, oh, this is a little bit sketchy and it gets moved down to somewhere in A tier. But I do think it's just a really good scenario. And I don't think the bad variants could be enough for me to not think this is a great scenario. I'm always a bit sketchy with cards like Inundated and Invasion, though where the card does not always do the same thing. The effect might always be the same, but what that effect entails is going to vary wildly. But even so, I do think it's a very, very good scenario. I think it deserves to be an A+. Maybe just barely, though. Which brings us to Devil Reef. And you really can't talk about Devil Reef without talking about the Devil Reefs themselves and the way they impact playing the game. So let's come over to the map that you're actually going to be playing on, which is where you traverse these five Devil Reef locations using your fishing boat, and moving through ocean locations without the boat is basically impossible. It's going to toss you two extra actions. So unless you can teleport or you just have five actions for some godforsaken reason, you're going to be riding around in your boat. It's going to drastically impact how you get around the map. And around the map, in a consistent set order, an actual map for once, you're going to be spawning out tidal tunnels and unfathomable depths according to each one of these locations, which are always the same. And the effect of this is that even though we're using the title Tunnels, the map doesn't feel random. It is still random. We're already moving two of the title Tunnels at random. We're going to have them placed at random. But it's limited a lot by being attached to the double reefs. And that's really, really good. It makes it much more tolerable the way that they're random. You have to get incredibly unlucky, such as just having two underwater caverns right next to each other for it to really, really bother you, the sort of variants you can see in Devil Reef. And a lot of really fun emergent narrative will always happen when this guy shows up, because he can't get into any of the caves. 
you have to get off your boat to go into the caves, but he can't get in there at all. So you end up in situations where the Terror of Devil Reef has chased you over here, and you flee into the caves, but your boat is over here with the Terror of Devil Reef. You can't leave. So one of you swims out to get his attention and pull him away, and then the other one comes out to get the boat and drive away. Or maybe it's simpler than that. Maybe your Kluber is just down here working through all three locations, while your fighter just stabs Terror of Devil Reef for several consecutive turns. But regardless of what exactly happens, in this scenario, there's always some form of narrative about how you're moving around with the boat, what happens when the Terror of Devil Reef shows up, and it's tuned really, really well. The flavor here is on point. You feel like you're sailing deep when infested waters, trying to figure out what's going on, and what you're finding really isn't enough to piece together a story just yet. And the actual gameplay of it is fluid and fun and really engaging for me. So where do I place Devil Reef? I really don't have anything bad to say about it. I'm going to put it at the bottom of S tier. I'm a little bit hesitant about that. The possibility of bad variants being super harsh does seem like it's there. And I can definitely see a team that has a weaker fighter just being like, guys, I can't do this, and that being a pretty negative experience. But for me, as someone who really highly values difficult, engaging gameplay, the limited variance in this seems like the exact right amount of RNG to have. And the gameplay pattern is just really fun. Like, the flavor it has is well executed, but not the best in the world. But the gameplay of Devil Reef is just incredibly well executed, and I really enjoy this scenario. Coming over to the second half of the campaign, Horror and High Gear is the first of four consecutive scenarios to suffer from the same problem. Ensmith has given you too much experience. Luckily for Horror and High Gear, it's a gimmick scenario. And I think because it's a gimmick scenario, the developers had a better idea of what characters would be able to do and were able to better tune the scenario. Whereas in the next three that aren't gimmick scenarios, they all feel like walkovers, and it feels like they were tuned for less experience than you have. I'm not sure if it being a gimmick scenario actually did impact the tuning of this one, but Horror and High Gear is not a walkover. It's not quite as easy as the next three. So that point isn't going to be getting leveraged against it. Thematically, it does its job incredibly well, with a variety of new enemies that are all designed to like really evoke the feeling of being chased down the highway. The squid token and their catching up making it impossible for you to ever feel like you're truly safe. And then several different treacheries that admittedly are mean as hell and a little bit unfair. Um, I left out one. I'm pretty sure there's another one where you take physical damage, but oh well. These treacheries are designed to push you to stay in a car. So I do really feel like it does a great job of making you feel like you're in a high-speed car chase, and its tuning is good enough that I always feel engaged and like I have decisions to make. The problem is partly just that I intrinsically dislike gimmick scenarios. When you start tinkering with how Doom works, or how movement works, or how fighting works, or as well how finding clues works, you start veering away from what is Arkham, and it can be a real slippery slope to just not being fun anymore because I didn't sign up to play that game. I think that Horror and High Gear executes its movement gimmick well enough that it doesn't hit that point. But what does happen is that it pushes you towards being in a car so aggressively with things like Test 5 Head Take 3 Horror, or if you're in a vehicle, the driver, who you know has good head because that's why you made them the driver, takes the test, and if they fail, everyone takes 2 Horror. Like, this really pushes you to be in a car. And I'm not a fan of rotting remains, but I appreciate why it needs to be in the game. This card being in the game is brutal. I don't like rotting remains variants that are designed to pressure me into playing a certain way. And I've already been pressured into playing a certain way by the fact that we're in a gimmick scenario. So it does feel uncomfortable how much my decision making can be constrained in horror and high gear. The flip side of really liking engaging gameplay is that the only correct play is evade or kill the enemies, find the clues, go forward. There's nothing more than that. It stops being engaging no matter how hard it is. Because I'm not really making decisions, I'm just rolling dice at that point. And Horror and High Gear starts to veer into that a little bit. Where basically every time I felt like I was making a decision, I was like, man, why are you not just driving forward? Why are you not just finding clues now or driving forward? Why are you doing anything complicated? And that's not a fun place to be. I do legitimately think that Horror and High Gear gets to live at the bottom of my A tier, though. It's probably my A tier's gatekeeper. I can't imagine an A tier scenario being worse than Horror and High Gear. There are definitely some things I dislike about it, but the flavor is so on point in terms of evoking the feeling of a car chase that I think it carries it back into the A tier, even though mechanically it doesn't quite make there. I will say, though, 
But there's a unique point against horror in high gear and the house always wins into a lesser degree Essex County Express. Which is that even though each of these three scenarios are thematically really on point, in terms of the campaign as a whole, they're on point for a thing that doesn't really have anything to do with the overarching plot. When you think about the Dunwich legacy, do you think of gambling with gangsters while you're trying to find a missing person? When you think about the Dunwich legacy, how many trains come to mind? And when you think about Innsmouth, how frequently do you think of high-speed car chases? So, yeah, they're on point thematically. They're evoking this idea really well. But ultimately, the idea they're evoking doesn't build the campaign towards anything. And that's kind of unfortunate. I feel like it's better in Essex County and Horror in High Gear, where like at least what's happening is plot-wise related to the campaign. At least in Essex County, they're trying to steal the book, and in Horror in High Gear, Innsmouth is running you out of town. The house always wins, the only one where it's a like, real major point against the scenario. Because legitimately, the only reason the house always wins takes place in a casino is so that there's a reason for the mobsters to show up in Scenario 5. And I guess I'm okay with that, because I love Blood on the Altar because of those mobsters. But like that is actually the only reason that you went to a casino. Because they had to find some reason for the mobsters to show up. Anyway, that doesn't affect my ranking for horror in high gear. Let's move on to a light in the fog. Actually, let's talk about all three of these scenarios for a hot second, because I'm going to say this for all of them, so I'm just going to say it now. These three scenarios are all too easy. They're not tuned to the amount of experience that you're going to have, and all three of them use the title tunnels. And at this point, the title tunnels have overstayed their welcome. It's impossible for me to evaluate any one of them in terms of are the title tunnels overstaying their welcome without looking at all three of them, because all three of them do nothing interesting with the title tunnels. In The Pit of Despair, it was a tutorial. In Devil Reef, it's attached to a real map. So in both of those, I'm completely fine with it. But in all three of these, I cannot look at the title tunnels deck and tell you that it was used in an interesting way that improved the scenario. That's just not the case. So it overstays its welcome, and it just gets repetitive and feels like it shouldn't be there. It feels like they didn't have time to flesh out the concept they had with them. So between... A core part of the gameplay, the locations you're going to being repetitive, and the game being undertuned, none of these scenarios ever stood even a ghost of a chance of making it into my A plus tier. But let's go through them individually and talk about what stands out for them that's good and what stands out for them that's bad. A Light in the Fog has these really iconic Deep One Hatchling and Nursemaid enemies, but I just somehow didn't ever spawn during my two fisted campaign on the channel. But they actually are like really interesting, well-designed enemies. The Deep Wood Hatchling is usually not that big of a problem, but the Deep Wood Nursemaid is absolutely terrifying, and you really need to find some form of counterplay so that this thing never engages you. Pretty much no matter what the reason is, you do not want this thing to ever touch you, because Forest after it engages you draw the top card of the encounter deck is terrible. That is easily the worst Deep One engage effect in this entire campaign. And with these two cards, you might think that the scenario is actually going to be pretty hard, but I'd actually say this is the easiest of the three. I feel like there's just enough counterplay for the Nursemaid and Hatchling that they're usually not problems. And then when you actually look at A Light in the Fog, much more than the other two scenarios, A Light in the Fog is just tidal tunnels. You start with five very short locations and a very short act one, and then you move into the basements, and the basements are just a 4x3 grid of tidal tunnels with a staircase going through it. Like, that's actually all it is. This scenario just feels like tidal tunnels to me. The part where you're not in tidal tunnels is so short. What's added to the tidal tunnels is so small and so inconsequential. And this, more than any other scenario, is the one where I'm like, Christ, did it really have to be tidal tunnels again? And I think I'm the most upset about it, because I can see this scenario being one of the best scenarios in the game. If the title tunnels had something more interesting going on, I don't know what, but anything to make it just not a grid of title tunnels. And it then, like, it was actually tuned to harder. If I showed up, like, 15, 20 experience ago, I could see this being one of the most engaging and difficult and memorable scenarios, where you go into the basement, and Osiris keeps getting back up and trying to throw you in jail, and everything's flooding, and it's just, like, the second version of Pit of Despair, but much, much more fun, and you feel like you have much more autonomy and a better understanding of what's happening. I can see that. I can understand how cool it could have been. And that's why I feel so bad about Light in the Fog, is because it just fails that. I'm not afraid of the title tunnels flooding. I'm afraid of getting bored and walking away from the table. It's 
it's undertuned and it's just doing the same thing we've been doing and it's so hard for me to care in Light in the Fog. The reason I'm so hard on it is because I can see how awesome it could have been. I can see how Deep on Hatchling and Nursemaid might combo together to create really interesting problems. I can see how Osiris is a unique threatening enemy. I can see how this place flooding could be a much more interactive version of Pit of Despair's flooding mechanic. And it just never gets there. It doesn't happen, and it's not the scenario that anyone wishes it was. Coming over to the tier list, I think that A Light in the Fog deserves to be somewhere near the top of B tier. I think Black Star's Rise is a similar scenario where mechanically maybe it's not quite as good as A Light in the Fog, but thematically it's much better. Because A Light in the Fog really just does feel like more Innsmith, whereas Black Star's Rise really does feel like more of its own thing with the double agenda decks and finding out whether the path is above or below to enter Carcosa. I think it's a little bit worse than Black Star's Rise, just a little bit. It's very close. And it is substantially better than these three. I think all three of these are like the low end of B tier. And I could be grossly underestimating a Phantom of Truth. We'll see when I finally play the Delt version again. It's been a while. I do not think the Conviction version of Phantom of Truth is actually good at all. And I feel the need to mention this every time that I come to this tier list video. And I'm like, man, Phantom of Truth is really low here. I wish I could remember what the Delt version had been like. Coming down to the layer of Dagon, if you just look at what I've got set aside, you might think this is like a damning condemnation and it's an awful scenario. The identifying cards are Acolyte and the Curse Token Deep One, who's really just here as a shorthand for Curses. Because the mechanics unique to this scenario are shitloads of Cultists and Curse Tokens. Because they do use both sets of Cultists. They don't just use the Dagon set or the original set. They use both of them, and it's kind of, to me, the iconic part of the scenario. The problem for me is that, yes, it can be very hard to efficiently deal with the Acolytes. The map is not conducive to killing multiple Acolytes quickly. All of the difficulty, really, is in getting through the Curse Tokens and killing these Doom-generating Acolytes. Actually, like, killing the normal enemies and finding the clues is not particularly hard or well-tuned. So almost all of the difficulty in Layer of Dagon is things that can feel kind of frustrating and bad. And while I really enjoy the start when you're exploring the Esoteric Order of Dagon again, and I really enjoy the very end at the Layer of Dagon and the sudden realization of, oh god, these curses are a serious problem. We could just wake up Dagon because of this. All of that's really good. But in the middle... What could easily be the longest part of the scenario for a lot of people. You're just in the tidal tunnels. And I do mean just. It is literally the tidal tunnels. And they're in a circle and that's it. That's all you get. And thematically, I actually really enjoy that. I really enjoy that you're just beneath the Order of Dagon. And while you're down here in these tunnels that cover the length of Innsmouth, there's constantly acolytes and cultists walking down from the Order. Like, thematically, that's actually really cool. There's just this flood of worshippers coming beneath the order. But gameplay-wise, man, I wish it wasn't the title tunnels. Or I wish they'd been laid out in a, anything more interesting than just, it's a circle around the starting point. And the Lair of Dagon really just is held down by that constant complaint in the second half of this campaign. I wish it wasn't just title tunnels. I wish it was harder. So where do I put the Lair of Dagon? I think it's better than Horror and High here. I think it's better than Lost in Time and Space. Thematically, I like everything that's going on in it. Most of my criticisms are directly related to the tuning and the title tunnels. I think I like it more than Pit of Despair. And Curtain Call. I don't like it more than Midnight Mass. It's never getting into A+. And even as I say I like it more than these, I'm not confident. It's somewhere in here. I think I do put it at the top of A tier just because of how good the moment where you meet Dagon is. And thematically, it does feel really good, even though gameplay-wise, I just wish it wasn't the title tunnels. I think if this was the first time I ever experienced the title tunnels, if I showed up to stand alone Lair of Dagon, I would easily be putting it at the top of A tier. I wouldn't be put, even considering putting it lower. I'd be like, man, I don't think it's better than Midnight Mass, but it's really close. And it's only because the title tunnels have overstayed their welcome that I'm considering that. So I think I am going to leave it right at the top of A tier. I can definitely see it moving down over time. But I think this is where I'm happy with for now. Which brings us to the last scenario and to the Maelstrom. You would think, considering this is a set of cards where I pulled out five different copies of Ancient Evils, that Engine the Maelstrom would be a really, really hard scenario. 
treacherous depths might not be ancient evils, but considering you're flooding your current location and the goal of the scenario is to unflood the scenario, or the alternative option of discarding assets and you played those for a reason and you don't want to do that, like, treacherous depths might not be ancient evils, but it is directly preventing you from completing the game, which ancient evils is doing the same thing through different methods. It's lowering the clock as opposed to increasing the objective. So if there are six different cards in this encounter set that say, hey, the Doom Clock is going to go faster, you would think this would be like overtuned high variance garbage. And I'm sure there is somebody out there, right, who failed Conspiracy of the Deep Ones like twice and got several Ancient Evils in the first two turns, and progressed Act 1, or Agenda 1 rather, on turn 2, right? Like, I'm sure that's happened to somebody. Or rather, they would have progressed the Agenda at the start of turn 3, but whatever. Like, these cards, I look at them, I'm like, wow! What were the designers thinking? That's so much doom. But at the end of the day, I believe the agendas were 6, 8, and 10 doom for a total of 24 turns. You've got time, and like the enemies are not actually that tough. If Dagon or Hydra are actually in play and you're fighting them, then these brood enemies die instantly because the effects on those ancient ones cause the damage you deal to also hit the broods. Even though these cards seem like they should be horrifying and like grossly difficult, the way the Doom Clock works out, the strength your decks are at, the lack of real challenge in the Shroud locations and the enemy difficulty, you just steamroll into the Maelstrom. Like, you can steamroll almost every finale. But into the Maelstrom is the one that I would expect you to steamroll. Where if you told me you had a hard time here, I would do a double take and be like, are you sure? You play the rules right? What happened? Tell me your story. I want to know. Because Into the Maelstrom just doesn't have any challenge. This is all of the challenge. It's these cards. And if the only challenge is Doom on a scenario with a massive Doom clock, then... Well, it's gonna be a walkover. That was a foregone conclusion. So I guess, what do I have to say about it that's good, huh? Because at this point, I've just made it sound like the worst scenario ever. I think I should mention that I have spent actually like a minute of real time sitting in silence thinking. And instead of thinking of what's good, I keep thinking over and over again. Did they really start the finale with a circle of tidal tunnels? So I should mention that as something that's like really bad and hard to avoid announcing. You can technically skip it if you don't care about the true ending. Like, if you skip it because the act deck lets you, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Wow, I actually thought I had way more good to say about Into the Maelstrom than I do. But everything in it's just so undertuned. The beginning, the first part, is... Like, I can't judge it as the finale of Innsmouth without being like, man, we have used the title tunnels in four of the previous seven scenarios. Are you sure you want to do this again? Are we going to mix it up? Are we going to do anything interesting? And the answer is just no. No, we're doing title tunnels again. There's nothing interesting happening. Well, what are we doing in the title tunnels? You're getting random keys. Oh. Okay, then. Wow, I didn't realize how little I felt positively about Into the Maelstrom until I sat down to think about it. What do I have positive to say about Into the Maelstrom? The broods of the Ancient Winds are really scary if you're not currently killing the Ancient Winds, which for most of the scenario you won't be. I like that. I like the super threatening deep ones that are directly associated with the Ancient Ones, but there's only like two of each in the encounter deck and they're probably not going to be a problem. Especially once you realize that the Doom Clock is actually very soft. Because it's tuned around those guys existing. Aside from being a weak scenario, there's not anything really wrong with Into the Maelstrom. But like, it's worse than a Light in the Fog. Because with a Light in the Fog, I can see how it would have been great. But with Into the Maelstrom, I'm just like, man, this needs like some serious polish to get anywhere. Like, this just goes to show you how low in the B tier these scenarios actually are in my mind, and I'm not ready to move it lower. I thought Into the Maelstrom would go in high B tier, or maybe even in A tier when I was thinking about this. But as I sit here, I feel like I'm placing it too highly by putting it here. I don't know. I don't know. Into the Maelstrom has me really surprised at how little good I had to say about it, despite how it feels when you're playing it being fine. And I know fine is the name of this tier, but fine kind of has like quotations around it and slight eye rolling, to be honest. 
I'm not playing Arkham Horror because it's a fine game, right? It's a good game. Most of the scenarios in it are good or better. And Into the Maelstrom just, like, surprised me by how close to fine it actually is. Like, I almost want to put it at the very top of C tier and be like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. Honestly, am I doing that? Am I just being like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with Into the Maelstrom? Thematically, it doesn't really do anything for me. Mechanics why it's only engaging until you realize that the Doom Clock is too soft or anything to matter. I really don't feel good putting it under Essex County and House Always Wins, but I can't like form an argument right now that it should be higher than this. Which is not what I expected to be doing. I did not think Into the Maelstrom would be ranked this lowly. I don't know what I thought would have been the second worst scenario in Ensmith, but I wouldn't have initially thought it would be Into the Maelstrom. And I guess that's because with a lot of the other scenarios that really are better, like A Light in the Fog and Horror in High Gear and Pit of Despair, where respectively they're, like, falling short of what I expected for them, a gimmick scenario and a tutorial, like, I have very clear problems with those scenarios, but they're doing something well. And the problems stand out by contrast, whereas with Into the Maelstrom, I feel like it's all problems with no high point, unfortunately. Why is Lear of Dagon so much higher, then? Why do I like Lear of Dagon so much, but not Into the Maelstrom? Because Lear of Dagon had a real map at the start, and the climactic point with Dagon is actually a threatening, difficult scenario? Like, there's just stuff going on in Lear of Dagon that's not going on in Into the Maelstrom. If you want to make Doom a threat, then putting two sets of cultists in the bag is a really engaging way to do that, but if you want to make Doom a threat by giving me nine copies of Ancient Evils, that kind of feels terrible for me. Lair of Dagon just doing everything Into the Maelstrom does better. And the biggest point against either of them is they both just throw down all the tidal tunnels in a circle. Be like, yeah, there's your act. Go for it. Go get some keys, dude. I feel like this video may have been a little bit more cynical and down than I really feel about the campaign as a whole. I think part of that is that I'm recording it for the second time because the first time OBS pranked me and stopped recording pretty much instantly. So like a little bit less raw enthusiasm is coming through. But part of it's just that a lot of Insmith has problems that, when you're playing it, don't really stand out that much, but when I'm trying to like actually critically think out the scenarios, really, really stand out. And as negative as this video might seem, like, I think it's very apparent from the rankings that I think Insmith is a much better campaign than Dunwich. Before I end the video, I do want to say, I really liked playing through Insmith both times I've played it so far. Despite how negative this video is, um... Like, most of these things are still ranked in good or higher, right? There are only two scenarios, Vanishing and Into the Maelstrom in C tier, and everything else is in B tier, or higher. I say everything else is in B tier, there's one scenario in B tier, three of them went into A. Before this video, A tier was basically empty. I do think Innsmouth's a very good campaign, but when I'm talking about it critically, and the criticisms are across the whole campaign, bad tuning and repetitive use of title tunnels, that I just feel like I'm going on and on, and it's kind of drowning out that I do really like the campaign. Because with Pit of Despair, I'm just like, hey, Pit of Despair is a great tutorial, moving on. And then I have to spend several minutes talking about how great Light in the Fog could have been. Or like five real-life minutes realizing that I have nothing nice to say about Into the Maelstrom. But yeah, I do really like Innsmouth. Anyway, I feel like I'm rambling, I've said what I had to say, I've reviewed the scenarios. I've been Rather Incoherent. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then give it a like and subscribe for more content like this in the near future. I'll see you in the next one.